disappearing paranormal werewolf in the house. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a rare New England dogman or werewolf story for you. Like many other scary stories from up north here, there's an eerie and spooky edge to it. Actually, I don't think this is even a story. It's more of a collection of anecdotes that happened in our house and around it. This neighborhood and the woods behind used to all be part of the grounds of this former estate. We're in negotiations with several of our neighbors right now, so we better not say exactly where this happened and continues to happen at this stage of the talks. For now, I'm just going to say that we're in a grand old house, which has seen better days, in a port town with the woods behind us. Some of this overgrown and terrifying forest is still part of our backyard, but most of it is now what they call a conservation area. Apparently, conservation area is a fancy name for swamps and woods. When I say we're in a port town with water on one side and deep forest on the other, it probably brings up romantic images of dark shadows and weathering heights, at least for those of you old enough to even know what I'm saying. We are actually about a half a mile from the shoreline, which is about a 10 or 15 minute walk depending on how much of a rush you're in. True, there was a time when the owner of this house owned all the land in that 13-minute walk, but those days ended when Thomas Jefferson was still alive and kicking, and I'm not related to the original owners in any way anyhow. I want to establish that this house has been in use for a very long time, and Lord only knows what happened on the land before the house was built. Now, this is a house that, as far as my husband and I have been able to figure out so far, had no prior history of strange phenomena. We were able to get it at what to us seemed like a surprisingly low cost, though. We even hired someone to go in and look for structural damage, but we never really figured out why the house was so cheap. We now feel pretty certain that something frightened off the previous owners, although, as I've already indicated, nobody from that family will tell us anything about their time here. This is another reason that we've got to keep the location a secret for now. I don't want to be accused of putting words in that family's mouths. If they say nothing weird happened here when they were here, then that is that. But then, what else caused them to practically give the house away? We might never know, but provoking them won't help matters. We're trying to handle the situation delicately and with respect. We don't want to anger them in any way. We have no right to intrude on their privacy. I felt that this place was haunted and so did my daughter from the day we first started to move boxes in. We moved in gradually in stages over a week or ten days since there was a lot of furniture left in the old house and we wanted to decide which of it we might want to keep or auction off before moving our own stuff in or trashing it. My husband and our son only started to notice the weird nature of the place after we'd all slept there a few nights but we all understood early on that this was not an ordinary house. Before month two started for us here, the four of us were all using the word haunted to describe where we lived. It seemed to us like we had a poltergeist at first. We would hear things happening in the attic, then go up there and find our stuff had been knocked over. Same with the cellar basement. We ended up storing breakables in hallway closets and locking them, and that seems to be working for now. The ghost or whatever it is doesn't go into the locked closets. We didn't see what was doing all this, so it was natural to assume that it was some kind of a ghost or haunting. One Saturday, when my husband's mother was babysitting so that my husband and I could attend a wedding, she became the first in the family to see what we all later started to call the werewolf. Gran, as the kids call her, brought some laundry down to our laundry room in the basement and she decided to do me a favor by washing it up for the family. Only when she got close to our basement laundry room, she says a wolf with eyes as bright as flashlights blocked her way to the washer dryer. Gran insisted to us that the wolf was taller than she was, and it had to sort of lean its neck down just to look her in the eye. And then, once it had her attention... Gran says the creature lifted its front paws off the ground and stood there on its hind legs hunched over like an old man with a pain in its back or something. Well, Gran left the laundry basket where she was and she claims she walked calmly away from the monster 
and then back up the stairs to the kitchen. My kids, however, say she screamed a lot and fell twice while climbing back up the stairs on her hands and knees. I'm sure the truth lies somewhere in between. So, even though none of us had seen any hairy monsters in our basement before, we all believed Gran when she told us her story, and I banned the kids from going down to the basement alone. Of course, they wanted to sleep overnight down there because I am raising kids as crazy as I was at their age. I was next to see the creature, but it was not in the basement. In fact, I saw it opening the door from the basement and starting to walk into the kitchen. I screamed and instinctively ran toward the door, slamming it shut and accidentally knocking the wolfman backward down the stairs. I locked the door to the basement and called my husband to come home from work and deal with this monster down there. By the time he got home, though, the werewolf-wolfman thing was gone. My husband searched the basement for where it could be hiding, where it could have gotten in, where it could have gotten out. He scored zero on all three. I told him he wasn't looking hard enough, but he took me down there and showed me how the walls were all stone. And it all looked pretty uniformly old. Like, really old. I don't see how a spider could have gotten through that wall, let alone a wolf larger than Gran. But we know he was physically real, because otherwise I couldn't have knocked him backward down the stairs when I slammed the kitchen door into him, right? So it wasn't a ghost. It was something physical that then somehow disappeared? When I saw it, the thing appeared upright to me, standing like a man. I saw it as a werewolf, not just a large wolf. I'm not sure if it looked the same as Grandma's wolfman, but it was a wolfman. Mine wasn't hairy all over, and I could see man-like muscles on him. He had strong-looking arms and a broad chest like a human. We don't really know if this is a manifestation of a dogman from the ancient past that we're seeing, or if we have portals in this home that the creatures walk into and out of from other coexisting realities. They seem very real while they're here in this reality, that's for sure. One of them shoved my husband into a wall and hurt him. Wait, let me tell that story from the start, in the order it happened. First of all, we had a New England ghost hunting group come out to the house. I won't name them. Well, we had two different ones at two different times. The first one brought a lady who called herself Psychic, who told us that we were being haunted by the ghost of a prehistoric dog who was supposedly buried somewhere in or under the house. We needed to find his remains and give them a proper burial for the hauntings to stop. Now that sounded idiotic to me because what kind of a proper burial would a prehistoric proto-canine expect anyway? A mausoleum with carvings? So anyway, that's what the psychic said and it came and went. Fast forward about half a year or so and the werewolf had started to show up in different parts of the house besides just the basement. Most of the sightings were split-second fleeting events out of the corner of your eye. One time my daughter saw one in her mirror and turned around to see the thing outside her window rushing away. But there's nothing outside her window. She's up on the second floor. There's no ledge out there. So what she described was impossible. Impossible for any other house, that is. One night we were all awakened by the sound of someone big walking up the stairs from the main level to the floor we sleep on. We all got out of bed and stared looking into the hallway when my brave husband went out there to confront this beast. This was a hairy man-like creature, but taller than my husband by a foot or two. He towered over him. He was bigger than any human could ever possibly get. The others say he was covered in a thick coat of dog fur, but once again, I saw something that looked more like a giant man with patchy, mangy fur. It was dark, so maybe that's why we each got different impressions of the beast. We all agreed that it had a dog-like or wolf-like head, not a human head at all, and that it was making growling and snarling sounds at the father of my children. He tried to talk like an exorcist to the monster to dispel it, but my husband is far from a priest, and he only got the dog-headed caveman thing angrier than before. The creature shoved my husband backward where he slammed into the hallway wall and cracked it open. 
The three of us ran to him, and we never noticed when the dogman disappeared, but he did. My husband had a bruised shoulder, but he had slammed a big hole into the wall next to my son's room. When he stood up, the mummified remains of a dog fell out of the wall onto the hallway floor. It seemed to have been interred in the wall at some point in the past for some reason. I don't know why. Now, this was not a giant dog. This was not a humanoid dog. This was just a medium-sized terrier-looking thing. Not even the size of a German Shepherd. I don't see how it could be related to the paranormal werewolf we were dealing with, but... My husband and my kids felt that this had to be the dog remains that the psychic had told us about. Now, I thought that was a load of rubbish, but they insisted we give the dog a good burial out back. Well, we did. We even invested in a headstone with a carving of a dog on it. The three of them were convinced that this was going to get that dog man to leave us alone. I must be more cynical than they are because that just didn't seem to me like it was going to matter. The kid said that Wolfman deliberately threw Dad into the wall where the dog corpse was interred, right? It did it on purpose. Now, I agree that it shoved my husband on purpose, but I don't see how it might not have been a random thing that he hit the wall where the dog mummy was. Now, my family disagreed with me then, and they disagreed with me now, so I let them do what they wanted. Finding a dead animal in our wall started the family talking about what else might be hidden in that place. Soon, my husband had some guys coming into the house with weird electrical equipment. They somehow were searching the walls and floors for secret passageways with that equipment. And they found two of them. One was, and still is, a sliding panel that forms a fake wall in the back of our bedroom closet. It turns out, if you go in there, it will lead you up some stairs to our third floor guest bedroom. Uh, apparently, that used to be the maid's quarters and the owner had this secret passageway put in so he could more easily cheat on his wife. Now that's thinking ahead. The other secret passageway is more mysterious, though. The entrance is located behind a grandfather clock that slides out of the way on the main floor. You go downstairs, and it turns out we have a second basement. This leads to a tunnel that's partially flooded, which ends in a door that was sealed over a very long time ago. Since that door now leads to neighbor's property, the story ends there for now, but... This is one of the neighbors we are in negotiations with, so maybe we'll eventually have a lot more info on that part of all this. My husband thinks the tunnels play a part in why this is happening, but he doesn't know why he feels that way yet. Our daughter is school friends with a girl who lives on that other property, and she says the girl knew all about our disappearing dogman. She says they have it in their house too, and that it lives in the woods between our two properties. I would like to get permission to speak to that girl myself, and that is one of the topics we are currently attempting to negotiate. Fingers crossed on that score. I had heard of haunted houses, but I hadn't heard of a haunted forest. When my son wanted his friend Kyle to sleep over, I was nervous about the dogman appearing to them in the night. But when the two boys suggested camping out in the forest behind their home, I foolishly thought that would be a safer option. I made the kids camp where I could see their tent from my bedroom window. This way I'd be able to check on them through the night if I felt nervous about anything. But what happened was that at 11.07 on my alarm clock, both the boys burst into our bedroom screaming that a monster tried to eat them. When my husband and I calmed the boys down enough that they could explain what they were talking about, they told us a story so wild that I wouldn't have believed it normally. On that property, though, I believed every word they were saying. And what they were saying was this. Hairy arms reached into the tent and grabbed my son's friend by his calves with hands. Human-like hands. And then this creature with hands pulled the boy out of the tent with one jerk of his strong arms. My son exited the tent to see his friend lying belly up on the ground with his big, nasty-looking, drooling dogman with red glowing light bulb eyes looking down at him like he was trying to decide what to do next. And that was when my son threw a temper tantrum. Well, that's not how he described it, but he threw a fit, cursing at the dogman. He says he told the werewolf that he didn't exist, 
and that my son didn't believe in him. The creature stopped staring at the friend on the ground, looked at my son instead, seemed confused, and then suddenly wasn't there. Both boys said it wasn't like he faded away. It was like he got turned off and then just wasn't there anymore. That was the most upsetting part of the story to them. The way he disappeared. You would think the monster leaving would bring a sense of relief, but it brought an increased sense of horror to them. Because now the world made even less sense to these boys, who were growing up and trying to understand this world around them. My husband thinks that our son saying he didn't believe in the dogman is what made the creature go away. I personally wonder if he was about to blink out anyway. He only seems to be able to be physically here for a short period each time, so maybe his energy just ran out or something. On the other hand, my husband might be onto something, I don't know. Maybe it uses our attention as an energy source. Take the incident in the upstairs hallway, for instance. Somehow it was able to wake us all up at the same time. Maybe it has more power in our dreams than in our waking reality. I can't really understand that part, but somehow it got us all up, thinking we'd heard a thumping downstairs. It used that collective attention, at least according to this theory, to make the sound of it walking up the staircase to the second floor. And that got us all out of bed and into the hallway, staring at the staircase. This increased its energy further, according to the theory, to the point where it could physically manifest and enter the hallway with us. When my furious and brave husband charged at the creature to protect his family, that gave the beast enough energy to throw him into the wall, cracking it open. But once we all ran over to see if my husband was okay, the dogman wasn't getting our attention anymore, and so it disappeared. Again, at least according to this theory. It's just a theory, though. I mean, I mean, again, maybe the dogman's time allotment in our world ran out. Maybe his energy to manifest ran out. It could have been a lot of different things. Although we have not had any incidents for a few months, we don't really expect the situation to be over permanently. To be honest, it would be a relief to be able to tell these stories in a purely historical context and not to have to worry about what's going to happen next. But whether it's stopped or whether it's only paused, we're working to secure deals with others to add to the information and a share in any eventual future earnings, assuming that ever comes to pass. We're not looking to get rich off this, and we'll share equally with all the neighbors. Our main long-term hope is to figure out what this is that's been happening to us, and to better understand why it's been happening to us. Hopefully you'll be hearing more about this by the year 2025. This episode was brought to you by executive producer Jason Kionis, and we wrote this song to thank him. Thanks, Biggie, and thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above 
gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 LaScary. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after, I think, three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back, come back for more scary, scary stories. stories.